All, all, all the elevators are blocked down. Oh my god, so both towers are now... Okay, now we can talk to you. I got an aircraft that's about east of the White House. So Act Responsible was born in 2001 in the aftermath of 9-11. Uh, we were at the time working uh, at adforum.com, who's a, uh, a database uh, gateway to uh, the advertising community. Half of the team was uh, in New York and life had to go on, but everyone was really shocked. And we said, what can we do? And someone from the New York team said, well, it's our business to help. So uh, we're going to call to the advertising in uh, industry, to our viewers uh, um, visitors, to create against violence and terrorism, to, um, in support of the family who have lost uh, loved ones uh, there. So we just you know, put a button on the website saying ACT, Advertising, Community Together. That's the, what it means, stands for. Uh, it's our business to help. In a month and a half, we received ideas, uh, already done um, ads, uh, films from, a hundred. I think the, the first year was a hundred pieces from 30 countries in the world. When it comes to like activist advertising or being a responsible organization or company, I always think about the words of my uncle Terrence Roberts, who was one of the kids who integrated schools in Little Rock, Arkansas when he was 15 years old. He was one of the first students to go to school as a black student where white students went. And he said, no matter what you do, you have to do it for social good. So whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a craftsman or a carpenter, you have to do it for social good. women's rights, gay rights, um, equality, diversity, sustainability, corporations need to take a stance on things and they have to be fearless about it um, as long as it aligns with their values. And that goes down to influencers. We have to get the right people to be fearless about what they stand for. And if they do that, I think they're doing the right thing. Causes have always been there, it's just that uh, now brands are, are realising they need to support it and the media realises they need to support it. Uh, however, there's a long way to go. Brands have always had a purpose and a social purpose. It's just coming to uh, the surface a lot more these days, facilitated by social media and, uh, and activism. Uh, and brands are, try brands are trying to harness that. Our own research suggests that there is potential economic upside in brands uh, somehow harnessing social purpose. You know, whereas 100 years ago or 100 plus years ago, diversity was taboo and was something that people would shy away from or would even disgust people and would, you know, make people not want to purchase a product or join a club or whatever it may be. Now, today, it's almost the opposite, in my opinion. It's almost like if there is no diversity, then you don't want to partake in that company and purchase and put your money into that brand. I think now you need diversity um, to really attract people. The content creators understand that creativity is most effective when it has purpose, when it resonates. Whether that's someone buying a product or someone looking at a product, traditional advertising, whatever it is. And I think, yes, at a time of political turmoil, a lot of anger in the world actually, standing for something as a person means more. And if a brand stands for something in addition to serving a purpose, smelling great, looking great, those two things align and they work best.
Colin Kaepernick refused to stand during the national anthem, taking a knee to protest police brutality. Nike revealed Colin Kaepernick as the face of its latest marketing campaign. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Is Nike taking a risk? I think they're taking a stand. This campaign was about uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, protesting last year, I think all of us will remember. And they took the guy with the voiceover on the video and his face on the billboard. So everything was resonating between all the medias, you know, print, video, and it was absolutely amazing how can a brand like Nike uh, give hope or give confidence to all of us. Tonight, the first game of the new season, and Nike is running an ad featuring Colin Kaepernick. If people say your dreams are crazy, good. Stay that way. Most of this country was talking about this last night at their dinner table. And I'm never buying another Nike product again. Nike's stock today dropping 3%. Who's going to win this cultural showdown of standing for the end? We are. Check this out. <laughs> I went out today and bought me some Nike stock. Oh, yeah. I want to applaud Nike. Speak up. We're right behind you. This thing is bigger than just the United States, and I think it resonates throughout the world. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. It's always complicated and complex to find the right fit, because the NGO or cause-related whatever association the cars need to find the right fit with the brand, and the brands need to find the right fit with the cars. Well, there's definitely risk attached, you know, and you know when you—that's the problem. When you take a stand, you can, you have to accept that you're going to upset some people, and uh, and you know certainly for some brands that's a, a step too far they you know they don't want to do that they're all about appealing to the, br the broadest audience but i think the reality is that uh if you don't take a stand then you don't you don't sort of stand up and get noticed Most people know us through the pink dot on the driver's license. And our challenge is that there are 114,000 people on the national waiting list. That's why we created our initiative, Second Chances. Second Chances is a program that partners with law enforcement to get the important word out about becoming an organ transplant donor. When the officer makes a traffic stop and they find out that the driver is an organ donor, you'll get a second chance and we'll issue a warning. Today we're gonna to go out there, make contact with the public, remind them and thank them for being organ donors. That's what the Second Chances program is all about. Hi there. Can I see your license, registration, and proof insurance, please? The reason why I stopped you is, uh, what's going on with your registration? I collect you have 54 going down, and the speed limit's 45. The reason I stopped you is you failed to stop for this stop sign back here. I noticed you're a donor. That's good. Yes. All right. Here's your paperwork. Give me just one minute. I'm going to write you a citation, okay? I'll be right back. So I am giving you a ticket, but the ticket I am giving you is a second chance ticket. Because you've chosen to become an organ donor and potentially give someone a second chance at life, which is awesome, I'm going to give you a second chance and not give you a citation. Okay? I don't even know what that means to me today. But that ticket is just showing that we appreciate you being an organ donor. What? I'm going to give you a second chance. Thank you, officer. How's that sound? You're letting me go pretty much for free. Really? How great is that? Oh, thank right? You. 
I mean, I think a lot of it goes back to what we call cultural capital. I mean, brands make the mistake of starting in a place where they say, this is our belief system. And then they try to preach that belief system upon people. I mean, if you think about it, that's sort of how religion works. This is our belief system. This is how we preach. I think as consumers become more and more aware of that, brands have a responsibility to demonstrate their values, how they treat their people, how they create their products, and most importantly, the value that they can bring to our world. I think nowadays, just to tell someone what you do or what you have and what you buy isn't enough. So as consumers, as we become more savvy, more aware of responsibility, you know, so the products you make, whether you're a fashion or you're a drinks manufacturer or a technology provider, we all have a sense of responsibility of what we do. Alex? Alex? Hello, you. <laughs> this is a miracle rescue, that all 13 members of the soccer team are out of the cave. He turns into a superhero, set on feeding as many homeless people as possible. This election, we've seen historic voter turnout. Oh. An all Asian cast, there's nothing more empowering. Oh. Oh. She has to go right up and do it. Yes! Will you marry me? Laura! You're in Laurel too? I was saying the word Yanni. And how if her difficult life may seem, while there's life, there is hope. <laughs> Kids have the dream, they just want to know that someone cares. We got love for you, it's only right, we gotta stay together. We still ask some of the same questions, you know, things like what is love, and that still appears as a highly high valued question, but our interest in the environment, in our world, in the climate, in the responsibility of the earth that we live in, I think that's a great thing. So as these become more aware, as people become more politically aware, more socially aware, more environmentally aware, it's not surprising that they seek out the questions and answers for this. What might be better is for brands to start from a place of what do people believe? What, do, what is the zeitgeist of the moment and what's happening in the world? And then try to come up with a way to speak to people in ways that they can, they can understand. I mean, especially with younger generations, When millennials engage with a brand, it's not just—it's not really just about buying a phone or buying some clothing or buying food or a, a product of some kind. It's about making a statement about who you are and what you believe. And so, when given the opportunity to, to, to choose between two similar products and one brand, uh, you know, has a has more social impact for good and another brand doesn't seem to be taking that element of its business seriously, millennials are always going to go for the one that makes them feel better about themselves. The transparency that consumers are expecting from the brands, and it's, uh, it's one of the biggest challenges that the brands have currently, right now, because thanks to technology, any single person can know exactly what's behind a product, what is a brand doing. The community has changed. Social media, everyone knows everything. So if a brand does something that is not in the right fit, the reputation of the brand is going down and down and disappearing because today you become a brand in a few hours, I would say a few months and you disappear the same way. So the risk, and the brands I think now understand that, yes, the brand wants to embrace because they know that their consumer 
need to have meaning to, you know, to the brand. The truth is only one click away. And this is changing all the relationship between the brands and, and their customers. So the rules have changed. And there is no other option. You cannot hide them yourself when you're a brown behind a beautiful campaign that's telling a story which is far away from the reality. You cannot lie to your consumer. The idea that the democratization of this entire industry has happened because of these platforms, um, giving people a voice, and with that voice comes responsibility and authenticity. Um, and if the authenticity isn't there, I think audiences, people, me, you, consumers, you can spot that in a second. Why is this person partnering with that brand? It's clearly for money. It's very clear when companies really care and when companies are just doing it for show. So during Black History Month, which is February, you'll see people who are all of a sudden, they don't hire black people, they're very racist in their policies, but they're gonna put up a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. because it's going to bring people in, they hope, or make them look good can't separate a brand from its product. So people begin to get suspicious when it's a company talking about animal rights, but it's a company that sells soap. You know, what do those two things have to do with each other? Um, then during Pride Month, which is June, you see organizations changing their logo to a rainbow, but supporting really harmful policies or supporting Donald Trump, who is against LGBTQ people. And I think people can really tell, especially young people, in terms of advertisers, you know, millennials, Gen Z, they're very easy to understand what's authentic and what is BS. I just think consumers are smarter than brands think they are. And I think that's our job again, to entrust brands with the right creators to tell a message that's all about authenticity. And again, I'm, we can all think of examples where we think of, why did that brand do that? Like, that doesn't feel natural to them. Why does a soap brand now need to say, put a rainbow on their soap for the month, if they've never thought about that before? So it's, it's just all about storytelling that feels real and authentic and credible. And for me, if that's, if you can fulfill those boxes or check those boxes, I think you're doing it the right way. And so I think that companies really need to work with their staff and with their leadership on making sure they're living the values that they claim to promote. Otherwise, there's gonna be a scandal. It happens every time. The leaders really need to step up and really implement that as company policy and encourage their team members to open their minds and embrace working with all different kinds of people to put out the best work that the company can possibly produce. Our kids being raised with all those brands are not listening to all those brands. They're there, fine. They're listening to the brands that are telling them things they want to hear, things that make sense. I think uh, it's very clear to tell those distinctions and so when you have companies like banks who don't want to pay people to speak or don't want to pay people or don't want to uh, help LGBTQ people open accounts, but at the same time they're having a rainbow flag, that's complete nonsense. If you're going to market to that group, make sure you're supporting that group, employing that group, and working with that group in creating your campaign. Otherwise, it's going to fall flat and you're going to lose money. La pre preparación es la cosa fundamental. Si tú no se conoces, intenta conectar con todo, no no consigues resultados tan buenos. Pero si así te conoces, sabe cuál es tu valor al mundo, consigue percibir a quién personas esto es es de fato relevante, conectarlas al momento correcto para que la comunicación se explote. with up to 200 species becoming extinct every single day. Erosion of fertile topsoil. Deforestation of our great forests. Toxic air pollution. Loss of insects and wildlife. The acidification of our oceans. These are all disastrous trends being accelerated 
by a way of life that we, here in our financially fortunate part of the world, see as our right to simply carry on. And that is why millions of children are taking it to the streets, school striking for the climate to create attention for the climate crisis. You need to listen to us, we who cannot vote. You need to vote for us, for your children and grandchildren. I actually think Greta Thunberg is a great example of um, the limitations of, of branding because she's somebody who, she does not have relationships with brands. She is an activist, she works on her own, she does her own thing, she's not, she's not in partnership with a company. And in some ways, and I, I probably there are a lot of people at Cannes who won't want to hear this, in some ways that makes her more powerful. I think that concern for the climate will infiltrate most of our lives. I think people will start eating, dressing, traveling in a way that is sustainable. Um, and I think that brands that can make it easier for people to do that will be, uh, will, will have a real head start. So I think now that the, the NGOs uh, with advertising, uh, the advertising industry, because they work much more together, they are tackling much more practical issues so that people understand that climate change is due to plastic in the ocean, is due to the plastic around the food. And it has the impact, is, it's actually I'm seeing it now, so it has the impact of our biodiversity, animals disappearing. Millennials will tell you they will switch brands if you don't do something that uh, you know, supports the planet, supports humanity, uh, adds some good to the planet. So I think they're the ones driving uh, brands to move from let's do a little bit to everything has to be about that and it has to be true and authentic and you know that they, they they research brands and if it's not authentic and if it's just a sort of a, a greenwashing statement or something they'll they'll move on so um, so I think it, that's what's driven the importance of it I think and the and the smart clients have kind of woken up to that and gone all right well this this has to be core to what we do I'll use the example of Patagonia the, the jacket company it makes sense for them to be to be into environmental causes because they sell to people who are outdoorsy and if the environment changes, those people don't have the ability to go outside and do the things they love, hiking, camping, uh, fishing, exploring. That makes sense for that brand. I see some other social causes that brands adopt. It doesn't necessarily make sense for them. I think millennials in particular are looking for brands that can walk the walk, not just talk the talk. It's not enough to cut an ad that looks progressive on some level, but your company is still, uh, you know, incredibly un unsustainable in the way that it does its business. So um, I think brands who understand that and who know that they, that really they have to totally reform the way they do business, they can't have, you know, um, CEOs flying around on corporate jets if they're saying that they're a sustainable business. Uh, those are the kinds of things that will help brands really own this. We're facing a greatest threat in thousands of years. Climate change. Governments will meet to address the defining issue of our time. For the first time, there'll be one seat there that's not for a nation. It's been called the people's seat. And the idea is it will give ordinary people a voice on this all-important issue. The United Nations is launching a seat, the people's seat. 
climate change is actually too important to leave to government. That is why Sir David Attenborough is telling people all over the world, if you don't speak up, nobody will. Use hashtag take your seat to send your message. Climate change is already affecting us in a really scary way. I'm Ulla Jones. This used to be my home and my neighbor's home. I want the world leaders to recognize that threat and take action. We've seen all these young people respond to the hashtag take your seat. The thought that people could speak directly to those who are responsible, how could it be more powerful? It is the most important seat you will ever take. And what we did is match them with hundreds of creators globally to tell their story about why climate change matters and what they're doing to fight it. And so in that case, absolutely no money was, was, was charged or taken by the creators because they were passionate about that subject and it was so authentic for them to talk about. It started a movement that resulted in literally billions of impressions around this one day and this one moment. I think that if a company is trying to capitalize on a social moment, they can't just do it artificially, they can't just do it inauthentically, they really have to collaborate and work with the people who are on the ground doing the work if they're really trying to make an impact. And there are companies who are trying to do that, but we need far more. The way we currently consume meat, the way we currently wear, you know, clothing that has been mass produced in fat, tremendously wasteful ways, uh, the way we, you know, fly on airplanes that, you know, burn gallons of fossil fuels, we know that that is not sustainable. The question is, how do we not do that? How do we, what do we do about it? How do we fix that? And, and, and the brands that are at the cutting edge of allowing people to live their lives in a, in a helping people live their lives in a sustainable way are the ones that are, that are gonna own the future. The favorite ad in uh, education is the one for, from Skoda, actually it's a brand, uh, with uh, a dog in, uh, in the back of a car, uh, and it's like an oven. Today, the temperature will rise to 30 degrees. Your car will heat up like an oven. Inside, it could reach over 60 degrees. Just 10 minutes in this heat could prove fatal to your dog. And parking in the shade or leaving a window open won't help. Never leave your dog in a hot car. A message from Skoda. It's very clever. And, and the general public, general public is um, touched by, by those kinds of, uh, of image and campaigns. Hi, I'm Aldo, 32 years old. Although I have cerebral palsy, I do everything I can to conduct myself like everyone else. But in my own home, of all places, I'm surrounded with furniture crying out, cripple. I'd like to sit on a regular sofa without being afraid I won't be able to get up, to open a regular closet, or even to turn on a regular lamp. One in every 10 people in Israel is a disabled person. The IKEA design vision gave birth to the Disables Project, Smart Hacks, making IKEA's best-selling items accessible. The project was created in collaboration with two NGOs, Milbot and Access Israel, and started off in the IKEA store with a hackathon of product engineers and disabled people that enabled better understanding of their needs. In the end of the developing process, 13 new products were born, each solving a different accessibility issue, such as sofa elevating legs for easier ascending, lamp button enlargement, special handles for PAX closets, and more. The new products are presented in the world's first accessible living spaces in the IKEA stores. The new models are available for download from the project's website, disables.com, and 3D printing anywhere in the world. So that Eldar, Dina, Pavel, Inbal, Moshe, Tahel, and Miguel can also feel comfortable in their own homes like everybody else. Now they should come up with products that assemble themselves. So I, I like the fact that brands are starting to think about, uh, well, how, you know, how does my product work for someone who's deaf or blind or disabled, etc. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, so the creative uh, on the campaign um, was, was 
or has cerebral palsy. And he, uh, he was hired by the agency 18 months ago as a creative person, just because, not because he had cerebral palsy, just because he was an incredibly talented creative thinker. And I think uh, he was the one that sort of led the, came up with the idea of like, how can I make uh, a brand like IKEA, which is their client, more accessible to someone like me? And for me, it's one of the most wonderful stories about uh, sort of diversity and inclusion because you would never get an idea like that if you didn't, if we hadn't hired somebody who came from a diverse background. And I think that's, you know, that's that's to me ultimately what you get when you when you bring sort of divergent and diverse thinkers together, you get ideas that you didn't expect. Being Muslim, a lot of people think that Islam is very repressive and very subjugating and um, you know very critical, but it's important to understand that there are so many different distinctions between the sex and between the people and between different traditions. And so uh, for me, Islam and you know whether it's creativity, whether it's you know being myself, there is no difference because I think that our goal in life as people is one, to do good services for other people, but also to be ourselves. So it's about inclusion and embracing diversity. And in the case of Whopper Her, which was the campaign from uh, Saudi Arabia, it was a celebration that women were out finally able to get a driver's license in that country. So um, um, we celebrated that by offering a free Whopper for any women driving to, through our drive-thru uh, during the week, uh, the driver's license became officially available. My abuela used to say, there's no good or evil, there's always just balance. I've had to walk through the world as a black queer femme for a long time, so I've had to find that strength inside of myself when I can't find it around me. Sometimes it's hard to visualize what the future will look like and if it will be better. But if we don't try at all, nothing can change. There's a really big difference between the sex you were assigned at birth, gender, identity, and sexuality. Those are three different very things. And I think, you know, the education around that is becoming more and more, but it is still, in my opinion, non-binary is really hard for people to understand, especially using gender neutral pronouns like they, them. We hired a uh, transgender creative person uh, just because he was talented. He came in and said, did you know that you, if you're transgender, you can't put your transgender name on your credit card. You have to put your original name, which of course is incredibly confronting when you walk into a shop and you look like a man, but your card says you're a woman. Handing over my card makes me feel very anxious and nervous. Just a total invalidation of my identity. I tried not to focus on that because it happened so often. I used to have moments of anxiety and moments of panic. It puts me in a place where I feel like I'm in danger. It just sucks every single time. They look at it and they look at you, and they look at it and they look at you. Oh, is this actually you? Are you serious? Oh my God. Stop. That's so cool. That's incredible. That's who I am. That's who I actually am. 
So he worked with MasterCard and they came up with a new sort of program called True Name, which is about you can, you can put your chosen name uh, on the front of the card and on the back you just in small type you have your legal identity which is a big thing for someone you know in the transgender community so those are t to me they're great examples of when you hire people that are not like everyone else you get different ideas um, and I think that's a, a, an amazing example in action. of somebody who came from what would be an underrepresented or marginalized group within your own community. Think of somebody who's transgender and within that person's community they may not have known other people who were like them, they may not have been received in their physical community in the way that they want it to be, but through the internet really and Facebook building on top of that, they can find other people who are like them to build community. YouTube is a, a, a platform on which, you know, free expression is a vital, a, a vital part. And so, you know, we've, over the years that I've been there, you know, we've seen, you know, it gets better and, and, and coming out videos and there's a, a huge amount of, of people in the LGBT community who have not been represented traditionally in our media who are able to be themselves and express themselves uh, in, in, um, in their own ways. And, you know, we see that in uh, you know, people uh, of different ethnicities that aren't necessarily represented in, in, in TV in the same way that they are able to be represented online where you know, different audiences from different countries can engage with what, they're, what they have to say and, and what they care about. I think that discussing diversity and inclusion is extremely relevant and important you know, because the youth that is coming up today, Gen Z and Millennials, they're identifying more and more as gender fluid and the mentalities are changing, you know, we're living in a different place and I feel like if you're a company that isn't really wrapping your head around that and you're slow, then you're running the risk of looking, you know, like irrelevant. It gets better. You are not alone. And so I can now say that I'm queer and proud. Those things that people tease me about, they are absolutely true. And they're what make me <laughs> fabulous and amazing. There are so many people out there that want to love and support you. So just look for that community. You can find people. It's going to be OK. I promise that it gets better. I know because I am you. To see a viral campaign promoted and covered on MTV was really meaningful. It helped me get into LGBT activism. Working with It Gets Better made me feel so confident. It made me feel like I had allies and thank everybody who has ever made an It Gets Better video because you have made a difference in somebody's life. It Gets Better inspires all young people to accept themselves. It has helped countless insecure boys and girls become confident men and women. So I think, you know, for us, there's many different issues that play out on the platform, but it's the free expression ones that I think most closely align with the, what, you know, what YouTube makes possible. In the last six years, we have made progress. But let me be clear, we are far from where we would like to be when you think about who we are in the world, who we serve in the world. We've seen increases along a number of different vectors. So the number of women, the number of women in technology, One very underrepresented group in the United States. We have grown those numbers by 25x the number of black women since we started focusing on this and 10x the number of black men. Now, I'm proud that there's that growth, but I know we started with too few. So even with those huge multipliers, there's still a long distance to go. Where we should be headed is where we can have real diverse representation at every level, in every function, in every job group, which is really the ultimate, which is total representation. If I could say that Facebook has uh, taken a stand for something, it's for the ability of people to have voice. That's what we are about. We are about uh, giving people the opportunity to have voice, to have presence. And that is why, for instance, we make the product free for everybody to use, as long as you have the internet. But even if you don't have the internet, we have an initiative called uh, internet.org, where we try to bring internet to people because we want people to have equal access to that opportunity to have voice. 
So that is what we are here for. That is what we feel very, very strongly about. So my advice to agencies who are really powerful to make the big change and help us going through all that crazy environment, helping our kids to find their way, is to stay, please stay creative, but do not do only ads to win awards. Ask the general public what they think, because there is a difference between the two. Thank you.